In the next chapter, we will be interested in where a function is continuous and where it is discontinuous. So we're going to look at continuity, and we're going to locate places where the function is continuous and discontinuous. So first of all, in example 10, we're asked to find x values for which the function is discontinuous. All right, so here we have the picture. And what we notice is that it looks like we have an asymptote, two asymptotes, in fact, right at these two places along the graph. How do we find out what those two values are? Well, in order to find that out, it's very similar to finding the domain of a function. We're going to take our denominator, and we're going to set it equal to 0, and then we're going to solve for the places, solve for those x values that cause that to happen. I'm going to solve this by factoring. We have x and x. It looks like uh, 7 and 2 minus 7 and positive 2. So we get two places where we have those asymptotes. We get x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 7. I'm just going to label those on our graph. And we see at those two places we have the asymptotes. So I would say that the function is discontinuous at these two particular values. The next function here, notice that we don't have any variables in the denominator. This is what we call a polynomial function. And polynomial functions are continuous everywhere. So this is a very nice function. We have only positive exponents. We have no variables in the denominator. Therefore, there's no issues at all. Okay. If I look at the picture here, I notice that I can draw the entire picture without picking up my pencil. This is what we call a continuous function. It is continuous everywhere. So it is not discontinuous anywhere. So continuous everywhere. So let's talk about where a function is continuous. So in this example, continuous everywhere means that basically continuous for all the real numbers, for the entire real number line, from left to right. I can draw the entire graph without any holes, without any gaps, without any asymptotes, um, no problem at all. The top function is continuous where? So we've already identified the two places where it's discontinuous. So that means it's continuous everywhere else. So it's continuous from negative infinity all the way to negative 2. But we don't use negative 2, so I put the open parentheses there. Then we'll say union. And then we're going to go between negative 2 and 7. And then we're going to say union. So it's continuous everywhere between those two values from here to here. And then it's continuous everywhere after 7. So I go from 7 on. So we'll say 7 to positive infinity. So it's discontinuous at those two values and continuous along certain intervals, but not continuous for the entire graph. Because in order to draw this, I would have to draw this piece and then pick up my pencil and come way up here and continue to draw my graph. And then once again, pick up my pencil and then continue drawing the graph. So I'd have to pick up my pencil twice. Therefore, it is continuous at two locations. Okay, so we're going to talk about this idea of continuity at a point. So we want to get just a general idea of what we mean by continuity. And continuity basically boils down to the idea that we don't want to have any holes, we don't want to have any gaps, no jumps. So we want to have a smooth function that I can draw without picking up my pencil. So looking at this graph here, we notice we have several places of discontinuity. A, we're discontinuous at A, because when I come up to that, I have a hole and I have to pick up my pencil to go on the other side. So we're discontinuous there. And then I'm discontinuous once again at B. And then I can draw my graph, keep drawing, drawing. And then when I get to C, I have a jump. So to actually continue to draw my graph after C, I'd have to pick up my pencil and come back down on the right side. So discontinuous at C. And then it looks like the graph goes up to positive infinity. And it looks like here that there is an asymptote. And then on the right side, it looks like 
the graph is going down toward negative infinity and then goes up to the right. So we're discontinuous at those three locations. So holes, jumps, gaps, all of these things, asymptotes, would prevent the graph from being continuous. Okay, so here's what we want to do for the next few problems. We want to look at where the function is discontinuous. We want to identify any values that cause a hole, a gap, an asymptote, any kind of problem in the graph. So we're looking at rational functions or those that have uh, variables in the denominator. We're going to take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and this is going to identify any place where the function becomes undefined. Remember that if I have a number and I divide by zero, then that gives me something that's undefined. And we know that at those places, we're either going to have holes or we're going to have asymptotes there. So we're looking for those holes and asymptotes. I want to know what x values do I have a hole or an asymptote. So we'll take our denominator, set it equal to zero, and figure out what x values cause the problem. So the function would be discontinuous at x equals 5. In this case, it looks like we would not be able to factor and cancel out the problem, so it looks like in this case, if I were to graph it, I would see that there's an asymptote there. Okay, we're going to do the same thing here. We have a variable in the denominator. We're going to take the denominator, set it equal to 0. We're going to solve for what x values might cause the problem. So here's where your college algebra skills come into play. We're going to solve uh, this equation by first taking the square root of both sides to get rid of the square. Technically I do plus or minus, but we want to make sure of something. We know that plus 0 and minus 0, let's just make note of that, plus 0 and minus 0 are exactly the same thing. They both just equal 0. Okay, So 0 does not have, an, have a sign. Putting a plus or a minus sign in front of 0 changes nothing. It's still just 0. So what we really have then is just x squared minus 3 equals 0. I'm going to add 3 to both sides. I'm going to solve using that square root method. So I get x squared equals positive 3. Then I'm, once again I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Now keep, keep in mind here that plus and minus 3, or plus and minus the square root of 3, we need the plus and minus here because plus square root of 3 and minus the square root of 3 are two different numbers. So we have two places where the function is discontinuous at positive, three, positive square root of 3 and negative square root of 3. Now, the next example here is a polynomial function. Notice that we do not have any variables in a denominator. And from your college algebra days, and even potentially from 0310, you would recognize that this would be a parabola that opens upside down. So this right here tells me negative in front tells me it's upside down, and the x squared tells me it's a parabola, so an upside down parabola. We can notice from this that the picture I could draw that whole picture without picking up my pencil. Smooth, continuous curve for polynomial functions. So this function is not discontinuous anywhere. So we'll say that this function is continuous everywhere. So no places of discontinuity. I'm going to keep all of this stuff in mind. These are all of the things that we will be asked to do in Chapter 3. And in fact, um, some of these are exactly the same functions. So this is a really important topic, and we will revisit this as part of the problems that we do in Chapter 3. So here we have a variable and denominator. So I want to find out where we're discontinuous. I'm going to take my denominator, set it equal to 0. We get x squared equals negative 1. We're solving using that square root method. So this is really important. Um, can you think of a number that you would square and get something negative? And the answer is no. This actually is not possible. Okay. So if you were to continue solving, which you don't have to continue solving at this point because this is not possible with any real number. Um, if you continue solving, you would take the square root of both sides and you get x equals, and that would be plus and minus. The square root of negative 1, if you remember from your 0310 days and college algebra days, the square root of negative 1 is an imaginary number. 
So the only places where this function would be discontinuous would be a would be an imaginary number. If you have only imaginary problems, then we have no real problems. So no real places of discontinuity. So we're going to say here that the function is continuous everywhere. And for both of these, we could say that the function is continuous for all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. All right, we have the last two examples. We want to find out where the function is discontinuous. Once again, these are problems that I've basically copied from chapter 3. And once again in chapter 3, I will ask you to determine where the function is discontinuous. One thing we want to be really careful about is the fact that we see negative exponents. In section 2.1, you were asked to review over negative exponents and how to work with them. So if you need to go back and review that video again, then you should do that. We will be working with negative exponents a lot in this, uh, in this class. So I see a negative exponent. Now I want to know what it applies to. It applies to everything here in the parentheses. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the function with only positive exponents. We're going to take whatever that negative exponent applies to and we're going to bring it down to the bottom of the fraction. Right now it's at the top. And when we do that, the exponent becomes positive. So that's the first thing you want to do. Now that we see that we have a fraction with a variable in the denominator, now I'm going to take that denominator, I'm going to set it equal to zero. And now we're going to solve using the square root method. So I get x plus 3 equals zero. And I get x equals negative 3. So the function is discontinuous at x equals negative 3. We would see, if we graph this, we would see that there is an asymptote at x equals negative 3. Okay, so the next one is very similar in that we have a negative exponent and I want to know what it applies to. It applies to this entire group. Here we have a fraction that's multiplied out front. What I would like to do is bring this to the bottom of the fraction to join the 9. Right now it's kind of at the top of the fraction. If I was to make it look like a fraction, I would think about putting it over 1. What we're going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as 4 divided by 9. I'm going to bring this entire group down to the bottom of the fraction. x minus 3, the exponent becomes a positive 2 thirds. So now we're going to take our denominator, set it equal to 0. Okay, we're definitely going to get rid of the 9, so let's divide both sides by 9. Now I'm left with x minus 3 to the positive 2 thirds power equals 0. And a couple of different ways we can deal with this problem. Um, one thing that I want you to keep in mind is what does something to the 2 thirds power mean? The denominator, remember, represents the index of the radical. This is also very significant, and if you need to review over exponents from section 2.1, uh, make sure you do that. This represents the power. So I'm going to rewrite this as what's actually happening. We have the cube root of x minus 3, and all of that is being squared. So if I would like to undo those two things to get at x, um, the value of x, the first thing I might want to do is take the square root of both sides. So now I'm left with the cube root of x minus 3, is equal to 0. And if I want to get rid of the cube root, then I would raise both sides to the power of 3. So we end up with x minus 3 equals 0. Eventually, you'll get to where you'll see pretty quickly that the only way that you can take x minus 3 or any base and raise it to some power, it doesn't even matter what the power is, the only way that you can do this and get 0 is if the base itself is equal to 0. Okay, because 0 to any power would give us 0. That's the only base that you can raise to some power to get 0. 
So eventually we'll get, get to that shortcut. The only way that x minus 3 to the 2 thirds power can equal 0 is if x minus 3 equals 0, the base for that exponent. So we get x equals 3. So this function is discontinuous at x equals 3. Um, it's something that doesn't factor or cancel, so we would have an asymptote at that particular value.